All right, guys, it's another Sunday Night Live session. I am the editor-in-chief of the Watercraft Journal. My name is Kevin Shaw. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, we have, yes, it is the New Jersey. And I typically, as you can see, this is why I don't wear red very often. Because I, too, am red. And so red on red looks kind of funky. So uh, anyway, that is the new red jersey. Um, it, this is the first one and came in about four days ago and I was all excited, but I was so busy. I haven't been able to take any pictures of it on a white background and I have not put it up on the store, but we are going to, uh, uh, okay. Sorry. So, uh, a couple things with the red Jersey, just so that everyone knows that the red Jersey is here. First and foremost, the the logo is kind of brown um and i didn't uh, i didn't know if it was a bleeding through problem or if it was just a dark maroon that kind of came through a little different but it is kind of a coffee brown so um i i think it looks okay we're not going to change it we're not going to make any changes to it but uh it is kind of a deep maroon uh so if you if you see it in different light I'm saying it looks brown in the camera. That, that's the thing. It is lit up in my office and on camera. I'm looking at it and I'm like, holy crap, it looks brown. It's not. It's more of a maroon color. So anyhow, this jersey, the shirt I am wearing right now, I have to photograph on a white background and we're going to upload it onto the store. And once it's uploaded onto the store, I'm going to do an announcement on the YouTube page, in the community page. I will all... I will also be doing a uh, news release on the magazine, the Watercraft Journal, watercraftjournal.com. And you will see an announcement with pricing. We still have like three, three or four of the double X blues. So any of you guys who want to get your hands on a double X, an XXL uh, light blue or the Bimini blue, um, I think I want to say there's three or four left. And we got them priced at like 30 bucks. So we're giving those away. Uh, this one, it was interesting. I, I'm trying to hold it up to the camera. It looks light. It's a little bit darker in person. It's a little bit darker in person. It's more of like a Corvette Sunfire Red. Uh, you know, like during the early 80s, that really vibrant red, that really red red. It's not like a Viper Red. And it's definitely not a Ferrari Red. Uh, Ferrari Red is a lot richer Viper Red uh, was really, really bright. Um, but sizes, I believe, are triple X. We don't go beyond 4X. Um, I believe the largest size is triple X, Chris. So we uh, does it float? The shirt itself? Uh, yeah, it should. Uh, I haven't actually tested it in water. I should probably go out and just throw the shirt in water and see if it floats. That's a good question. Um so anyway, yeah, it's more of a Yamaha red or a what I what my brain goes, oh, Corvette Sunfire red. So it's <laughs> that that is the color that I'm seeing that is in person. Um, but I can tell that the camera that I've got right here is throwing off the colors. So I apologize if you're like, oh, it looks kind of pink. No, it's really not pink. Um, the lighter spots are a light red, pink, I guess. Um, I'm pink, but the shirt itself is not pink. The shirt itself is red. So uh, that will be probably Thursday or Friday that this jersey goes live uh, on the magazine and here on the YouTube channel. So look out for those announcements. We'll have pricing and everything all dialed in. Um, so it looks orange. Well, it's definitely not orange. I don't, I don't know about that one. Um, but yeah, uh, the, the shirt's red. So I'm pink after today's ride. <laughs> Ouch. Um, okay, so the new jerseys are in. We have those. We have the last three. Um, yeah, I don't know about orange, man. That's uh, I don't know what to tell you about that one. Um, but okay, so that one's being done. Next item is the uh, uh, upcoming videos. We published last week. The Dan Tennessee ride. If you haven't already watched that one, it's about 14 minutes long. That's a really fun kind of an adventure ride. The next video coming up 
should be in about 10 days. And that is going to be the really cool review of the sea Fish Pro Trophy. We got our hands and spent the day with the Fish Pro Trophy. Um, got some unusual, got some neat footage, got a lot of aerial footage. Did not catch a damn thing at all. Uh, we simply had the wrong bait. We, we just had miserable luck all day fishing. But we got some really good fit, got some really good footage. Otherwise, uh, it, you guys care more about the ski itself than me catching a fish. So uh, I'm all right with that. Um, but let's see. So that one's in the works right now. I am recording. I'm writing the scripts and recording the audio, the voiceover for all three individual review or all three reviews of the three. Kawasaki 310 models. I'm doing individual articles and individual videos on those three models. I didn't want to throw them into one. I wanted to do individual. So it's going to be, it's probably going to be LX 310X and then 310 LXS. And, and that's out of order, but primarily because most people want to see the flagship first. So we're going to do the 310 LX first. And then I'm going to drop down to the turquoise ski and do the 310X. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the LX versus the X uh, in today's topic because it's very appropriate for today's topic. Um, and then we will then uh, have the LXS coming out. And those are going to cascade one after another. We're going to have a bunch of those coming out. Um but, uh, so, okay, let me do Fish Pro, cross that announcement off, and then 310 videos are coming. Uh, one last thing is we have footed, or we have a full report on the magazine, and that's on, um, yeah, that's on the Jet Jam round seven and eight. It, we got footage from uh, from Allie from that one. So you West Coast guys who are looking for some race coverage, we have some really bitching race coverage coming up probably Tuesday because uh, tomorrow is a shorter article. And then Tuesday is going to be the race coverage that we're doing. Friday is going to be the jersey. And then we have a news article and another feature coming up. We got I got like two weeks worth of content scheduled out that I'm having to reschedule um, just because of how last week or this last week went for me. Um, I was supposed to be gone all week and that was not the case. Um, all right. So let me talk a little bit about it. Um, a little bit about what happened to me last week. It has nothing to do with jet skis, but I am going to segue it into our topic. And that is, uh, since the beginning of January, I had been planning to drive my 1969 Dodge Charger on the Hot Rod Power Tour. Hot Rod Power Tour every year alternates its uh, its route, so it finds new routes to go through different towns and things like that. And this year, quite frankly, it was kind of in my backyard for most of it, and to the point that I could stay at my own house. I didn't even have to get a hotel room because it started in Memphis, went through Nashville, then it went to Hoover, Alabama, which is pretty close to where my wife grew up. And then down to Pensacola. And then it dogleg back up into Atlanta. And I invited my older brother to come out. And we, uh, I had really thrashed because I, I had the pressure up. I kind of wanted to be, you know, little brother wants to prove it to the big brother that my car's dialed. And I got all my crap together and my ducks in a row and blah, blah, blah. And for whatever reason... Things started going haywire on the build. Had to fix this, fix that, fix this, fix that. Stuff that I thought I had done started rearing its ugly head. So I started to sweat um, pretty close to deadline. But when that um, when it finally came to and my brother showed up on Saturday, uh, we were pretty much dialed for Monday morning. We head out Monday morning. And we're driving out to Memphis, and he's we've got his youngest son in the back seat, who's 14. Kid's a total savant. I'm super impressed by him. But we're driving out. Gear vendor overdrive's working great. We're going 75 miles an hour. It just cruises. It's doing really, really awesome. But the 
Tennessee Department of Transportation has chewed up the roads. The roads are trash. And we're coming into Jackson, uh, Jackson, Tennessee. And, you know, saw, you know, Johnny Cash saying about it, you know, we're going to Jackson. Um, I hit a rough patch and I'm trying to get around all these big rigs who are peppering the car with gravel. And I'm just like, get me out of this. So I'm, I'm on the gas trying to get out of it. And we hit this drop off. And I thought uh, it just went and, and scraped and bottomed out. And my brother goes, oh, dude, the tires rubbed. And I go, those weren't the tires. And my brain went, that could have been your oil pan. Because I had a real deep seven-quart oil pan, a drag race pan. But so I, I sweat. And I'm like, oh. So I start watching the oil pressure gauge. Oil pressure gauge does not move. Does not move an inch. So I am going, well, maybe I rubbed my headers. Maybe my head, because my headers hang low too. And I was like, okay, I might have scraped the exhaust. I'll live with that. So we drive another 10, 15 minutes, and I go, hey, listen, we should probably pull over and get some gas. We're 30 miles outside of Memphis. I'd rather get gas now. No problem. Sounds great. We'll use the restroom, get a Coke, whatever. So we pull off the freeway. We pull into this little tiny gas station out in the middle of nowhere. I fill up the tank. We trade places. His, you know, My brother and his son come out. I go in, use the restroom. I come back out. There is a pool of oil underneath this car, six feet diameter. Not a trail. I was not dripping oil all the way in. It was only when we stopped and the uh, external oil pump quit running that all the oil began to sit in the bottom of that pan, and that pan just let it all go. What had happened was that when I bottomed out, the back seam of the of the oil pan made contact and split that seam, and it was enough for the oil to come right out. So we pushed the car into the gravel so we weren't oil slicking down the whole freaking parking lot. We put it in the we put it in the gravel and let it drain its guts out and it just barfed all of its, you know, all of its oil out. We were able to get uh get me a ride home two and a half hours back home. I hitched up my truck and my trailer. And at the exact same time that I was hitching up my truck and trailer, a good buddy of mine who lives a few blocks from the house, he was texting me, blowing up my phone, going, Kevin, I have. I have an oil pan. I have a Mylodon oil pan that'll fit your car. And I'm like, no way, dude. I got a race pan. He goes, I have one. Let me drop it off. And sure enough, when I pulled in my Uber, that oil pan was sitting on the side of the house. I'm like, holy crap, this guy came through. So I jumped back in the I jumped back in the car, in the truck with my trailer and all my gear and everything like that. And I drive another two and a half hours back out. So it's like almost six hours of my brother and his son out in the sun roasting in my charger we hitch up the trailer we get the car up on the trailer and i have to use a come along because i'm not going to run that engine with no oil in it and we get that thing up there and then we tow another we tow it another two and a half hours back so it's almost 6 30 7 o'clock by the time i get home and we get it home i get it in the air and we start we pull the center link out of the suspension we pull the oil pan blah 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 we start wrenching on it and we get the oil pan that my buddy dropped off. We I had gaskets. We we only needed to do a few things on Tuesday. We upped the suspension, brought the nose up a little bit more, so we wouldn't bottom out anymore. I changed the rebound on the shocks. Blah 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 blah. Tuesday evening, we're all geared to go. We're like, dude, are we doing this? Are we doing power tour? And my brother's like, your car will make it, dude. It ran like a freaking dream. We just need to be careful about bottoming out the damn oil pan. And I was like, okay, all right. And then the phone call started coming in. And the text messages and the phone calls, and they were all saying, hey, have you left yet for Power Tour? I said, no, no. We, we missed the Memphis and we missed Nashville. So the next stop would be Alabama. And all my friends were like, if you haven't left yet, don't go. I'm like, what the hell? Why not? And they're like, bro, it's a freaking disaster. Um. People are waiting two hours to get into the venue. They're waiting two and a half to three hours just to register their car. It's a mess. It's 100 degrees out. People, There's five people in the hospital from heat stroke. There's already been six car accidents, and five new cars have been stolen. You know, Challengers, a Hellcat Durango. I mean, a bunch of cars are stolen. Not just broken into, stolen. And I was like, holy crap, what is going on? 
And then a friend of mine who was there on behalf of a classic car museum, he says, Kevin, I'm going to tell you the worst news. I go, okay, what's that? And he says, Toyota is the is one of the title sponsors for the Hot Rod Power Tour this year. I was like, oh, okay. And he goes, no, not okay. He said, as part of their agreement, they said any Toyota is allowed into the general parking. And sure enough, you start. We I started watching videos Tuesday night and all through Wednesday. Toyota 4Runners, Camrys, Lexus, a guy in a red Toyota Yaris crashed into a Mercury Comet. And it was like, all these people are showing up driving their wives' cars, their, their daily drivers. One guy's project car didn't make it, so he just rented a Toyota Camry and did power tour on a Toyota Cam- in a Toyota Camry. And I was like, well, that turns the parking lot into a Walmart. All right, it's a Walmart parking lot now. Because now it's any cars. I mean, don't get me wrong. Guys are showing up in Teslas. Guys are showing up in a Priuses or pre, they call them pre if it's plural. Then you, you, you know, you have all the guys showing up in new, Cam, you know, new Camaros and Challengers and Mustangs, which I'm like, totally, I get it. It's a 700 horsepower Challenger. It's a 660 horsepower Shelby Mustang. Of course you should be here. You know, Z, you know, Z06 Corvettes and C8 Corvettes and all these crazy modern cars. And there are McLarens and Lamborghinis and all these things. And at a point, I kind of went, when does it stop being the hot rod power tour and becoming cars and coffee? Because cars and coffee lets anything in. Toyota Supras, Acura Integras, you know, Mitsubishi 3000s. All, all good cars on their own. And I'm not saying it's not a worthy car. But at what point do you start being discriminatory. And I know that's a negative word is, oh, discrimination. <laughs> I can't believe you said discriminatory. But at what point do you start discriminating going, hey, listen, should we have a Tesla, a pla- even a Plaid edition that goes nine seconds? Should we have a Tesla Plaid parked next to a 33 Ford Roadster? Should the Hot Rod Power Tour have you know, 2009 Pontiac GTOs. Should these cars all be in the same place? Well, I understand they're looking at it at a promotion side going, the more bodies, the better. The more registrations, the better. The more money, blah, blah, blah. The Nashville stop had over 4,000 cars, had something like 4,200 cars. That's a lot of cars, all right? So we decided not to go. We were like, okay, we're cool. We're not going to go because it's it's a target parking lot. It's every car under the sun. You know, I'm going to park next to a white Toyota 4Runner, you know. And I'll be in between a Toyota 4Runner and a guy in a, in a 1500 Silverado with a Tennessee tilt where he's dropped the, you know, dropped the leaf springs and jacked up the front. And I'm like, why are you here? So why do I bring this up? I mean, why on earth am I even bothering bringing this up on a a jet ski podcast? Because at what point do you start to say enough's enough? At what point do you say we're losing, we're losing the spirit of this? You know, we've opened the doors so wide. We've allowed so much. We've kind of lost, we've kind of lost our way. And that's an interesting conversation. And I don't think I'm going to have answers for it tonight because I'm looking at modern watercraft and I'm going, I don't know if we've lost our way. I don't know if the industry has gone so far into one direction, so deep down this one path that there's no turnaround. There's no way to come back. And I'm, and I'm speaking, Johnny, yes, I, I, yeah, my buddy goes down to cruising the coast with his uh, Hemi convertible Cuda. He's got a 70 Cuda with a Hemi in it and a four-speed. He cloned it. 
but it's the best looking clone you've ever seen. And he he's been to cruising the coast three times, four times with that car. Um, but anyway, so I kind of want to talk a little bit about where we are, where we came from, and why why I see it being problematic. I'm not gonna. I'm. I, I don't think I'm going to get on a soapbox and start screaming that you guys are, you know, you guys who like the thing that I'm complaining about or the thing I'm making a comment about is wrong or you guys are lesser than. But I am going to address some stuff that concerns me. So I'm sorry about your feelings. I'm guaranteed I'm going to step on them. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I'm going to get that right out of the way. I'm going to hurt someone's feelings and they're going to get mad at me. But, like, but, 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 I'm like, I know, I know. I'm sorry. You know, the, the mean pink face ginger is making fun of me and oh my gosh, I'm I'm gonna unsubscribe and I, I downvote the video and okay. I'm doing this for shits and giggles anyway. All right. So um I did a video a few months ago. Actually, it was over a year ago, where I kind of went on a rant about backup cameras and trailer assist. And I kind of I kind of flipped out. I got a lot of, a lot of guys mad. Like, but I have a single place trailer. And I have a lifted F2, F250. And I can't even see the jet ski behind me. And I, I need to have it. I don't care. I really don't. Use your mirrors. My rant is... Listen. <sighs> When I first saw that Mercedes-Benz or BMW had parallel parking assist, I started grinding my teeth to the point I could hear it. I was like, oh my gosh, you are, you're keeping people from learning a skill. You're, you're removing the challenge. And so now you're making a inferior driver. That's what I felt about the parallel parking features that I'm seeing on modern luxury cars. All right. You literally put your hands up. The car goes. Woo, woo, woo. Er. Might as well open the door and have the seat tilt and roll your fat ass out of the car. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay. I mean, it was just ridiculous. And in the same thread with a lot of people with larger full-size trucks and have these really nice backup features where the truck will literally align the trailer using the cameras and it'll it'll squirrely wiggle wag all you you know back into a spot and it'll do it for you i've seen them i've seen these guys they don't have to do anything they put their hand up they put the car in reverse they hit the button boop 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 boop, boop and it backs the truck up and it'll it'll, it'll damn near launch the ski for you well, my problem with that is I have been on rides. I have been on group rides where someone stands there and says, hey, can someone back me in? And it's not, hey, I'm going to sit on my ski so I can launch. It's I can't back my car down the ramp. I am physically unable to back my own car down this launch ramp. I either do not have the visibility in my automobile, which means I picked the wrong car. It either means I cannot operate using my mirrors to back the car up and the trailer up. Or I have not decided to do the... Why am I always hating on Ford trucks? Because <laughs> 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 they're made out of tin cans. You lean up against it and you bend your damn bed. All right. Anyway. Um, or more importantly... They have, they have chosen not to take the time to go to an empty parking lot for 30 minutes and learn how to back their trailer into a spot. They've chosen not to do it. They've made that decision. It's a conscientious decision. I don't need to do that. I'll rely on someone else for me. Okay. Your, your Blanche Dublois in Tennessee's, Tennessee Williams, uh, a streetcar named Desire. I always rely on the kindness of strangers. All right. Seriously, dude, don't be that guy. Don't. I choose not to be. All right. Now, do I take, do I need multiple times to back a trailer in? Depends on the launch ramp. 
Depends on the approach. Even in my own truck that I've had since 2005, my old beater outside that's beat to hell, looks like a golf ball. There's not one straight square foot of that damn truck. And I'll tell you what, sometimes I'm like, oh, dude, there's no room. I can't get the trailer straight. So I'm sitting there going, woo, and get it in. And sometimes the trailer is jack, you know, cocked a little bit. Okay, fine. Guess what? I'm still doing it. I still use my mirrors, little fisheye lenses on the on my mirrors, and I back it in. Or if I'm in another car that's unfamiliar, put your arm on the backrest, do the one-handed, and pretend you're your dad, and back it in going like this. Okay, fine. Sometimes. But guys, it's a skill. And if you are a man, happy Father's Day. Most men like to learn and acquire skills. They want to add that to their toolbox. They want to go, I know how to do that. So that in the future, when people are watching or if someone else needs help, it's a skill. And you go, I have that on my tool belt. I can do that. Most men appreciate having, or most men appreciate building their skill set. I want to learn how to do drywall. I want to hang sheetrock, which is the same thing. Um, you know, I want to run electrical conduit. I want to do this. I want to learn how to roof. I want to learn how to fix my house. Blah, 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 blah. You learn a skill set. All right. And all of us are at different levels, dude. All of us are at different levels. I've met men who are 40 years old who've never changed a tire, but they go, Hey man, can you tell me how to change a tire? No, well, don't be embarrassed. I'll help you out. I'll hap happily. I'll happily do it. But if you come to me and go, can you change my tire for me? I'll hit you with the tire iron. Okay? But if you say, hey, man, I've never done it before. You know, I didn't have a dad or I grew up in New York and I got my driver's license at 30, whatever. I've met people like that who are like, I never got a driver's license. We never had a car. So, okay, I, under I understand that. That's fine. I won't judge you for that. I might bust your balls a little bit, but... I'm a I'm an asshole. That's what assholes do. So I I just sit there and I'm like, I have no problem with anyone. You could be 65 years old and go, hey, can you help me out? Not a problem. But if you say back my car down the launch ramp, I'll be like, I'll help you. I'll I'll guide you down, but I want you driving your car down because I want you to learn how to do it. All right. Does that make me a bad guy because I'm not doing it for you? I don't think so. Do a lot of people who are like, dude, I don't know what your problem is. Why don't you just help him? I am helping him. I'm teaching him how to launch his tra launch his trailer or launch his ski. Excuse me. All right. Acquiring skills, I believe, is a far superior pursuit than getting it done. I would rather have you stumble. I would rather stumble. I think I believe in God. I believe God would rather have me burn my hands and skin my knees long enough that I learn and grow and build skills and experience than just doing it for me. That's personally my philosophy. I don't think I'm alone on that one. I I, I would like to know if you guys agree with me on that wild rant, but I apologize. So... When I make the joke that I don't like cars thinking for me, see where I'm coming from on that one, okay? And Ford isn't the only one who's got backup assist. The trucks have GMCs all have it. The high the high level or the high level Dodges have it. Toyotas have it. They all have it. So um, I know I'm teasing the Ford guys, but everyone's guilty on that one. All right. So how does that? get us to where we are. Yeah, you know, Ford was totally first. And Ford's first on a lot of stuff. And good. That's great. Um, rightfully so. So why am I going off on like, you know, Hot Rod Power Tour and modern cars and trucks and all this stuff? And that was ultimately... Um, I... <laughs> My my oldest daughter, my kids are in the kids are in summer. All right, so I work from home now. The kids are running around, so my <laughs> my work efficacy has been cut in half. So um, 
my oldest daughter goes, hey, Dad, I'd like to, I'd like to take the new sea out. And, uh, hey, it's Billy. <laughs> Billy's here. Everyone say hello to Billy. I'm going to get a drink of water. My voice is already screwed up. Say hello to Billy, everyone. We got a hundred people. We got a hundred five people here. I want to see a hundred hellos. I want to see a hundred hello Billies. <laughs> That's funny. Um, so, oldest daughter says, "Hey, Dad, let's take the GTX out. I want to take the new GTX." So, oh, Billy. <laughs> One of the funniest lines from the cable guy, which didn't have very many. Um, so I said, All right, let's take the GTX out. I, you know, I, I put on a few hours on it, you know, earlier that week. I said, What the hell? Let's take it out. So we get out and I, I download the BRP app onto my phone and got my USB cord and blah, blah, blah. I was all ready to go. I couldn't get the damn thing to work. Dash kept saying, don't read your phone. Can't read your phone. Couldn't get the sound system to work, even just on Bluetooth. And we fo I fought it for about 10 minutes. I even had I even had corporate. I was texting. I was even texting corporate. I'm like, I'm, I'm sending them screenshots. I'm like, what the hell am I doing wrong? I got everything hooked up. I did everything I'm supposed to do that I've done before. Is this one broken? And they're like, no, man. <laughs> this is the one that we did all of our photo shoots with. This is the GTX that you see in all the pictures. I'm like, okay, then I don't understand. And they're like, we don't either. So it turns out my it turns out my Apple Lightning cord, whatever the hell, I had to go get a new Apple cord so it would start reading the data. It, 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 it would charge it, but it wouldn't actually communicate. And it took two days to go out and go buy another Apple cord and plug it in to make sure that everything synced and blah, 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 blah. And I sat there. And it was so funny was that I was screwing with the phone. And I was getting frustrated. And I was just like, oh, my gosh. Ugh. And I'm sitting there idling in the shade. And my 12-year-old daughter's like, can we just go? And I was like, what? And she goes, I don't need music. Let's just go. And I was like, well, this is a $20,000 ski. And I, I should have this. And she goes, dad, I don't care. Let's just go ride. And I had my phone in my hand. And I went, oh, my gosh, you're right. Put it in the glove box. Turned it. I turned it off. Put it in the glove box. Closed it up. Romped on the gas. It's a three hundred horsepower jet ski. Go ride. Go have fun. It's a beautiful day outside, and I'm farting around for ten minutes on my stupid phone, trying to get the damn phone to work with the GPS. And I was like, "What was I thinking?" And out of the mouth of a twelve year old girl came the most pure logic was I don't need this to enjoy jet skiing, dad. Let's go. Oh, you're right. Yeah. Oh, click. Where was my brain on that? And I realized I'm like, and I, we were out for three hours riding and I'm sitting there going, I, I and I was all, oh, dude, I was so bent out of shape. I was so bent. Because I'm like, I'm freaking stupid phone, start GPS. I hate this app. I have to download this stupid app, this stupid cord. And my daughter's like, Dad, I just want to go jet skiing. Let's just go on the lake. It's a beautiful day on the lake. Let's go play. And it took me like another 10 minutes to chill out. Because I'm in the mindset of someone who bought this thing. I'm in the mindset of someone who's waited months. Their ski's been waiting in a dealership. They paid the extra dollar for, you know, the extra big bucks for the tech package and they've paid all this stuff and they've downloaded the app and they've made it, they've downloaded the waves app and they've downloaded this app and blah, blah, blah. And they got all this crap and they're not enjoying themselves. They're pissed off at their ski. And I'm like, I've lost, I, I, I've lost the script. I've totally missed the point of this toy. And I'm like, okay. I fell in the I fell in the trap. I fell, me, me, me. I fell in the trap. And here's the problem. We get so wound up with the conveniences and so wound up and all the bells and whistles that we lose sight of what the priority is. 
And what's the priority? I'm getting out of the house. I'm getting out of the office and I'm hitting the lake and I'm going to feel the wind on my face and the sun on my shoulders and listen to the wind blow past my ears and listen to the roar of that engine. And if it's supercharged, listen to the, you know, the blow off valve as I kick over the waves and just ride, ride. And I'm like, oh man, that's, that's a problem. That's a problem. And I don't know if you guys, for you guys, if you guys were here last week when I talked about, or was it last week or the week before, where I was talking about my priorities when it comes, or what, what a new buyer's priorities ought to be. And number one was, how does it ride? How does it ride? How does it behave in the water? Because if that ski doesn't behave well in the water, I don't care how comfortable the seat is. I don't care how bitching the sound system is. I don't care how innovative the dashboard is. I don't care if it sits there and massages my butt like one of those chairs at Sharper Image in the mall. Remember when there was Sharper Images in malls? (laughs) <laughs> Pepperidge Farm remembers. Anyway, all that crap doesn't amount to hill of beans if the hull doesn't ride right. If that boat bow, bow hunts and goes anywhere the wind blows, you're like, this thing sucks. This boat sucks. And you're going to be like, yeah, I'm 18 grand into this thing, but I don't like the way it rides. And so number one priority is how does the boat ride? How does the boat ride? And that's it, man. Number one, out of the gate. All that stuff is fourth or fifth down the list. For at least for me. At least for me. And it is when I tell a lot of people, um, uh, they're still producing them, David. They're still producing them. It's just slow. It's just slow. You, you need to reach out to your dealer. Be nice. Be cool. Be friendly. Say, hey, man, I, I, I'm i sure it's really hard for you to tell me when it, I can expect it, but I ordered mine in August, and I, it's June. Should I just cancel my order? Because here's the reality, David. Chances are, by now, you've been bumped to 23. Your dealer is going to bump you to 23. I'm going to tell you right now. I, I hate to break the bad news. But I'm pretty sure you're not getting a 22. I'm pretty damn sure you're getting a 23. So let's move on. So I have to sit there when people ask me questions and I have to go back to the basics. I I mean, I have to really, really dial it back and go, what kind of water are you riding? What's your experience on skis? Where are you going on this thing? How good of a rider are you? How do you plan on riding? Are you racing? Are you offshore? Going hardcore offshore, standing up, bars up, bend your knees. Are, are you a cruiser? Are you farts, you know, farting around with your wife on the back? I mean, what's, what's your plan? Because people go, well, I'm looking at this and I'm looking at that. And I need to know the megahertz of this. And I'm like, no, you don't. You need to, you need to figure out what kind of boat you need for the water you're on. Oh, really? Yeah, really. I had a guy hit me up and he goes, he goes, well, I don't want to spend a lot of money. So I'm looking at a CD Spark. I said, oh, CD Spark's really affordable. I'm a great ski. And he says, well, how stable is it with two adults? I go, it's not very stable at all with two adults. I'm like, me and a little kid, it's not real stable. He's like, oh, well, that's a problem. I go, it's a problem. Right. And then I stopped and I go, where are you riding? And he's like, I, I can't remember what, what beach he was coming out of, but he's like, Lake Michigan. I'm like, oh, woo, pump the brakes. He's like, what? I'm like, absolutely under no circumstances should you <laughs> should you be taking a CD Spark with your wife out onto Lake Michigan at any time whatsoever. Lake Michigan is, is a war zone. <laughs> Lake Michigan is the roughest freaking water I've ever been on. I'm like, absolutely. He's like, oh, really? How about a Yamaha EX? I go, no. <laughs> I said, you need to go find something used. I'm like, go find a used Ultra or a used G- or a used FX. 
And he's like, well, how about the c -Doo? I'm like, I would not ride an ST3 c -Doo. Anything 2018 and up, I would absolutely under I, – I, I couldn't be paid high enough to ride an ST3 hull out in Michigan. I couldn't. Not enjoyable. And, and, and not enjoy myself. I could do it. Don't get me wrong. I can, I can ride that GTX wherever the hell you want me to ride, but I won't <laughs> – I'll complain the whole time. <laughs> I'll be a whiny freaking complainer. Like, I hate this thing. I want to sink it. So anyway. Um, but yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You got to stop and you got to think, what kind of writing am I going to be doing? What, Where am I going to be writing? So it. why I bring this up why I even do all this stuff is a potential buyer and even us, even me, I'm guilty of it. I just told you I'm guilty of it. <laughs> like Michigan. <laughs> oh boy. Uh, you find me a right. You, Chris, you got a route around Michigan. I'll consider it. Um, but Oh, Eric, hey, I saw your Facebook post. I didn't know it was a heart attack, buddy. I'm sorry to hear that. That sucks. It wasn't cardiac arrest. It was a heart attack because there's a difference. If so, buddy, I, I'm really sorry to hear it. I hope you're doing better. I hope you're coming around. Oh, boy, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, So let's get back to it. The Bluetooth syncing and the phones and the dashboards and the G GPS is always welcome. GPS tracking is always welcome because I always want people to have good navigation, not get lost. Uh, it's a safety thing. I really think GPS is the future, but um, the big kicker for all of this is don't be distracted by the sizzle when the steak is garbage, when the steak is no good. You know, the sizzle, you know, more sizzle than steak. Even a even a crappy piece of shoe leather sounds real good when it's coming in on a hot plate with, you know, spitting grease. All right. I'm I'm really cautious of people being lured by bells and whistles and all the fancy pants, you know, all the fancy pants stuff and not paying attention to what kind of riding and what kind of ski they're actually buying. All right. Um, and I'll, I'll give you a good example is how many P fajitas. Well, yeah, but it's really rare that I don't, um, it's really rare that I've, I've had bad fajitas. Um, so we actually we actually went out for fajitas uh, today for father for Father's Day. Um, anyway, uh, the GP. <laughs> I personally love the Yamaha GP eighteen hundred R SVHO. I love the HO. I love them both, but I love them for what they are. I'm not fooled or blinded. By all the stuff that Yamaha's put on there, by the digital dashboard and the Connect system, by the new sound system, by XYZ tilt steering, the new seat, blah, 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 blah. That does not blind me to what the GP is. And the GP at its core is a lightweight, closed course race ski. That's what the GP is. The GP is a lightweight, closed course race ski. All the lipstick and makeup, it, all the lipstick and makeup in the world is not going to make that ski more comfortable, smoother, more stable, a drier ride, all that crap. It is still a closed course race ski. And I keep telling people this. I go, dude, this is a race boat. And the problem is that there's guys out there who go, I want a race ski. I'm like, you weigh 350 pounds and you're six foot five. 
And I literally, I'm describing a buddy of mine. He's six foot three, 300 and something change, goes out and buys a GP SVHO. And I'm like, what on God's blue earth are you doing? And he's like, dude, race boat. I'm like, you're going to hate this thing. Oh, no, it's great. I'm like, you're going to hate this thing. Oh, yeah, I'll take my son out. I'm like, you're both going to hate this thing. And he's like, no, 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 it's great. Goes out. Man, this thing's fast. Oh, this thing hooks so hard. Oh, this thing corners so hard. Oh. How many hours you put on it? Oh, probably about 10. It's got 10 hours on the damn thing. Forked over some big money. For, he forked over some big money, and it sits on his dock. Beautiful dock. Takes a ski boat out. Why? Oh, the wife doesn't like the wife doesn't like the Yamaha. She wants to go out in the boat. Oh, okay. How come you haven't taken the ski out? Oh, son likes to go on the on the boat. He doesn't like to go on the on the on the ski. Oh, okay. Just sitting there. <laughs> Just sitting there. Who's right? Why? Because the guy's got you know. It, it's like. I want the I want the meat sampler. I'm like, bro, that six pounds of freaking barbecue. I want the meat sampler. He gets about half a pound into it, and he's like, oh, I'm not really that hungry. Well, you just dropped 110 bucks on the barbecue sampler. It's a lot of food going to waste. All right, that's my point. Is a lot of guys get all jazzed up on something they think they want. They don't use half the features. Or they're getting into a ski that beats the hell out of them. And they go, oh, I should have gotten something a little bit more attuned to my riding ability and to the environment that I'm riding it in. They don't consider that. So all that being said is what, what happens is in the case of the truck or the car doing the parking or the launching for them or the backing up for them, or the bells and whistles and all the little doodads on the ski, that really accounts for either two things. Disenfranchised buyers, buyers are like, I don't even like this purchase. This thing sucks. I've wasted too much money on it. All right. Which is great for people who don't mind buying a used ski. Okay, great. I picked this up for a song. It's got 15 hours on it. Guy never used it. He never even synced his damn phone to the thing. Okay, sweet. Get it for a song. Great. Or you're going to find people who, this is the dangerous one, are unattentive riders. Honestly, people who are more distracted, futzing on their phone, or hitting the sound system, or trying to navigate all the crap on their dashboard instead of riding. And so you have a distracted rider the same way you have a distracted driver because he's screwing around with all the different crap on his screen on his on in his car and now you've got a dangerous situation okay there's a there's a group of people on facebook who give me all sorts of grief cuz i'm like at no point whatsoever should you be drinking and boating it is the number one cause of mortalities on the water drowning accidents, all sorts of stuff. I'll, t- I'll tell you this. I'll give an example why I'm so vociferous about it. First girl I ever went on a date on date with. My dad drove me. I was in eighth grade. I think I was, what? What are you in eighth grade? 14? Beautiful blonde girl named Kelly Han. This is in Southern California. I had the biggest crush on her. I thought she was just fantastic. And we joked and we laughed and I was this zit face loser. And she was this beautiful blonde girl. And I said, do you want to go to this New Year's Eve dance? She goes, sure. And I show up in my stupid, you know, rayon shirt and silk tie or whatever the hell it is in 1990, 91, whenever. And uh, my dad's driving the, you know, driving us and we pick her up and she's a knockout and had a great time. And, but she went into swimming and diving. She was on the swim team in high school. I went to cross country and then I just became a degenerate who hung out in the parking lot and worked on his car. 
And Kelly went on and had a life of her own and all this stuff. And then, you know, I don't know, 10, you know, eight years ago, 10 years ago, we become friends on Facebook. I'm like, oh my gosh, Kelly Han, how are you doing? She's great. Single mom, has a little boy, blah, blah, blah. And she goes out to have a Sue for her birthday about six years ago. This is a girl who was a varsity level California state winning swimmer. And she's having a party, you know, birthday party, whatever. She's hanging out at the sandbar and she's, and everyone's getting lit. Everyone's having a good time. Kelly fall. Kelly's up on the back of this boat drinking falls back, hits her head on the outboard, splits her head open and drowns. And no one notices her body is underneath a freaking boat or a series of boats. She drowns to death. They had to go find her body like a day later. So I got a real big beef when it comes to alcohol and boating. You guys want to give me shit about don't have a beer when you're on a jet ski? Screw you. I'll never apologize for it. I will fight tooth and nail. I will go toe to toe with you. I don't care how, dude, I could go 10 beers in and I don't feel it. I don't give a damn. I don't give a damn. You blow a 0. 0.8 or whatever the state says. I hope they freaking roll you, dude. I hope. I hope so. I don't want you on the water. My my da- my oldest daughter was nine years old and almost got clobbered at a neat little, fun little spot on the lake by two drunk ladies. Totally, totally buzzed. Totally buzzed. And they came tearing into that place and damn near ran over my daughter when she was nine or ten years old. I pulled her out of the way. All right. So screw you. Yeah. Give me all the grief you can. Oh, Kevin's such a Puritan. Yeah, okay. Well, did you vote for Trump? He's a teetotaler. He doesn't drink alcohol at all. At all. At all. Anyway. So, back to that. Um, Unattentive. Unattentive, distracted riders. Because they're messing with all this crap. Now, c did a good job of putting everything on the handlebars. c said, listen, we're going to try to navigate. We're going to try to make all the navigation for the dashboard available on the, on the handlebars. Okay, great. You're still not looking forward. You're looking down. All right. Now, one of the other things is Yamaha is like, you can't even navigate half of our stuff on the Connect system. Uh, thank you, KR. Appreciate that. Uh Yamaha is like, you can't, we won't even let you mess with the dashboard if you're going over 10 miles an hour, or I think it's like 12 miles an hour or something like that. So they put the kibosh on that. Kawasaki, it's, you got the little knob and you can mess with it at certain speeds and your hands are off the handlebars. Now, mind you, thankfully, everything is here on your, on your right hand. You know, you got throttle, you got your brake, it's all there. And then you got your little stylus, you got your little knob right by your junk. So you got your knob by your knob and you're sitting there toggling the dash on the knob, but simultaneously you have the little, the little fob cont- sound system control fob ahead of the handlebars right by the dash. So it's way out of the way. And I had Bobby Kearns who works for Cowie and helped develop the damn system. He and I are walking through it. And I'm like, this thing sucks balls. I can't take this. This is driving me out of my mind. And it was funny because I was talking to the guys who were at Mudbug, and one of the dudes has an LX, has a 310 LX. He goes, Kevin, mine works great. And I'm like, walk me through it. And he put up a couple of videos, and he, he sent them to me. He goes, man, it sinks great, does this, does that. And I go, question. And I kept asking him questions about mobility, and he goes, oh, yeah, that's kind of a problem. Oh, yeah, you got to move that while you're driving, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, pain in the ass. Distracted driver. Distracted driver. And I'm sorry. I, I really do think, especially given how prone people are to accidents on a personal watercraft, what a massive problem distracted drivers are or distracted riders. Okay. I'm sorry, guys. You remember I did a whole video about going in riding groups? And if I'm in a group of riders and I don't see people swivel their heads around, I don't want to ride with them. 
That's why I was like, I love riding with Billy Duplessis and his crew because I can ride and stare at Billy. I can lock eyes at the side of Billy, and he will immediately know that he's being looked at. And he's like, hey, what's up? Or, without right, he's doing this. He could be alone 100 yards ahead of everyone else, and he's still got his head on a swivel. All right? He looks like he's got his head on a freaking 360 bar stool. Just, he's looking everywhere. And that is a rider that I trust. All right? This last group I went riding with, I paid attention to their heads just for fun, for my own sake. And there's people that I really like who are not looking over their shoulder. I pay attention. I look. And I'm telling you right now, I'm telling you right now, do not ride with people who do not have their head on a swivel. Don't. Say, man, I love you. You're a brother. You're great. You're a good friend to me, but you scare the shit out of me. I'm sorry to be, I think I, I've been swearing a lot today. I apologize. I've got an attitude. I, I'm sorry. I apologize, guys. I know I'm trying to keep this family friendly. Some of you guys listen to this in the car with your kids. Sorry, kids. I apologize. But you scare me to death, dude. You freak me out because you're not, you're never looking. You're never looking. And I can't be riding with someone who's who's not got their head looking around. You got to be looking. Those mirrors are worthless. God. Those review mirrors, I don't care what ski. I don't care what ski. Those mirrors are worthless. Keep your head on a swivel. Always looking. All right? Because who knows? Some guy might be in his glove box looking for something, and the he's got the bars tilted and not realizing that he's going, Woo! and he goes cutting across, can't hold his lane, goes right into – right into other people, or you get roosted because you're watching, you back off, and you're like, dude, this guy's a clown. I'm not riding with this guy. He's an absolute clown. All right? Now, don't get me wrong. I've caught, I'm, you know, especially if you're on an ST3 Sea-Doo, you're going to catch every wake, and you're going to get thrown left, right, and center, regardless of what you do. I literally have a video of me on the trophy being pushed into bushes because I caught the outside of a GTI's wake, and it pushed me out into the corner. And I had to get off the throttle, romp on it, and kick it out again. And I was like, this is a joke. All right? ST3s do not respond to rider input like any other ski. Any other ski, rider input. Now, mind you, RXPX does get pushed out. And you got to really get on the throttle to cut, get that nose and pull it in. But ST3, you're along for the ride. It's going wherever the hell it wants to go. Sorry, unsafe. So my big thing is unattentive, distracted riders. Unattentive, distracted riders are a safety concern. They're a safety concern. Am I being, am I being too cautious? Am I being too much of a, of a worry wart? I don't know. I ride with people I love on my skis. I have my kids. I have my wife. I do not want their legs broken or their backs broken or someone to die. Oh, that seems hyperbolic, Kevin. You're just you're you're just really going over the top, man. You're just, chill out, dude. It's fine. Okay. Okay. That's fine. Just take once. Just takes once. So that's kind of my biggest concerns. My biggest concerns are distracted, are distracted, unattentive riders or riders who are lacking experience and a skill set in diverse situations, okay? And we're going to get back into that. Um, we're going to get back. Uh, let me get into that a little bit. Okay. So uh, I talked about the GP thing. I am of two minds when it comes to, and I realize we're an hour in, and I, I didn't even started going through questions. I answered two super chats, but that's it. Um, I'm really of two minds when it comes to suspension on skis. I know I did a video talking about, like, hey, you know, it has potential. But here's the problem. The most dangerous consequence of suspension is not 
instability. It's not an unstable ski. It's a rider who is insulated from what's happening with the ski. Because if a rider it cannot tell where the ski is going, cannot tell what the hull is doing, they cannot make course corrections that could avert disaster, avert an accident. And let me give you an example. 2009, I cracked my sternum on an RX TX IS 255. How did I crack my sternum, even though I was wearing a life vest? What happened was that the IS, we I was going full tilt. I was going 68, 69 miles an hour in the Pacific Ocean, just off of Cabrillo Beach in Long, or north of Long Beach. And I, I was cooking because I was offshore racing at the time. I thought I was hot stuff. And that ski is doing this. This being the hull, this being the deck. So I'm bouncing along. And the hull is articulating. I mean, the hull's doing what the hull's doing. And the center of gravity, I have such extension on it that the center of gravity is throwing the ski off. Because I go down, low center of gravity. High, ski starts. I, I, become, an, I become an eccentric off the top of the ski because now my weight is way out here when i'm down low not that big of a movement but when i'm up here it's a big sway i start hitting some cross chop out in the pacific i go the ski goes one two boom and it and the ski goes completely left and i go into the bars over the bow I get flipped over. My head is effectively in the water as the bow of the ski rams into my chest. And I feel it crack. I feel it. And, I mean, Justin Standard, who worked with me, he was my associate editor at Personal Watercraft Illustrated when I was racing. He was alongside with me. He watched He watched me. His words were, you taco shelled over the front of that ski. He goes, I watched you. He goes, it was the most he goes, it was the most amazing, unbelievable thing I'd ever seen. He goes, dude, you folded like a taco over the front of that thing. And I was like, wonderful. And I was in bad, bad, bad shape. I hurt like hell. I thought I got kicked by a horse. All right. And for years, I could stretch my chest and pop. I, I could hear it pop. Um, it hurt a lot. And what I'm a pretty experienced rider. I don't get me wrong, I'm not Chris McCluggage, I'm not Nicholas Rias. I, I can't hold their water at all. Okay. But I'm no dummy. And I'm gonna tell you, man, that surprised the pants off of me. I mean, that really, really, really surprised me. And that was part of the problem with really aggressive riding with those suspension skis was you were so muted from what the de from what the hull was doing that you I couldn't make course corrections. I couldn't react in time. And that's a big concern that I have when you see steering assist, brake assist, steering assist and brake assist are my biggest concerns. Um, I, I was out with some people. One guy was on a Kawasaki and he goes, dude, I hate this steering assist, this off throttle steering assist thing with the Cali. And I go, yeah, I know. It's one of those things you got to get used to. And I noodled on that this last week in preparing for this topic. And I was like, no, he shouldn't have to get used to it. It, excuse me, he shouldn't have to get used to it. It shouldn't be on the ski because again, it's one of those things that are in there to accommodate riders who are inexperienced or unskilled. And I feel that we're doing a very bad disservice to new riders 
by insulating and padding their writing experience, you're making inferior writers. Does that make sense? Am I off base on that one? Because what's going to happen, hang on for this one. What's going to happen when electric assist steering starts happening? What do you think is going to happen when it's all fly-by-wire and they start with an electronic steering assist? So the throw isn't so far, but the steering response is adjusted electron or digitally. Do you think I'm crazy? I'm not crazy. It's already happened. All right. Any new skis? Nope. Not yet, but I know they're working on it. There's going to be steering assist. You want to know why? Because people are bitching that they have to do so much arm movement. I'm not joking. People are complaining that there's too much arm movement. And so they just want to do this. So now there's going to be dampeners that do all the work. For steering. When is it going to come out? Don't know. Will it come out? Possibly they spend a lot of money on it. Why? Because people complain. People complain. And they can't deal with complaints. They just curl up in a ball and go, oh, oh, oh my God. Oh, oh, they're mad at me. Oh, 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 what do we do? Oh, we go, hurry, sorry, fix it. Fix, throw some money at it. Fix it. Seriously. Really? Are you, are you guys crazy? But the, this is the future. All right. We got brakes. And the brakes are getting more and more and more advanced. The braking systems. All right. The reverse systems. The reverse systems are going to become mainstream. IDF. I Dude, we all lived through the first couple of years of IDF. And IDF has teething problems. Okay, fine. Is it getting better? Yeah. Works on that GTX. Great. Worked on the Fish Pro. Great. Okay, great. Expect IDF to become standard. Expect full reverse eventually with an actual dog, you know, dog gear transmission to become standard. That's happening. Electric assist steering. Standard. Full digital dash and Bluetooth integration, blah, blah, blah. These things are going to be $25,000. The new Cowie, hey, 2023, $19,999, $19, baby. It's a $20,000 right out of the gate MSRP for the 2023 310LX. They already announced the prices, guys. The MSRPs are locked in. I did the announcement. It's already there. It's 20 grand. And it's, yeah, don't get me wrong. It's, it's. Inflation and your dollar not being worth a damn, you know. But it's also the fact that it's becoming an Escalade. These skis are Escalades. They're going to have everything on it because people keep asking for them. So what do we do? What do we do? Okay. So I'm not... <laughs> I always liked I always like the definition of there's a difference between bitching and complaining. <laughs> the difference between bitching and complaining is in bitching you're just whining about something. In a complaint, you typically offer a solution. All right. I I I never discuss this kind of stuff unless there's a solution. What's our solution? Okay. So when I had the opportunity to go ride the, the new Kawasaki 310s, they at not at that dinner at dinner that night. They're like, "So, what do you think? What's your initial impression?" And I said, "I'd buy a 310X if it had two changes, which are minor." And they're like, "Oh, you don't like the LX?" And I go, "I don't need the LX." 
And they go, oh, but the LX is this, and the LX is that, and the LX is this, and the LX is that. And I said, the LX keeps me from enjoying the best attributes of this ski. And they're like, what are you talking about? And I go, the best attributes of this ski are weight displacement, center of gravity, and the and lo- a lower rider position. And I went into full detail on it. And I said, that, that alone is what makes this ski phenomenal. And they're like, but what about the sound? The GP? I'm like, I couldn't get your sound system to work. Your dash was unnavigationable on the water. I said, I don't need the deck extension. I can tie a cooler to my regular rack, you know, a, a rack. I already have a rack. I can put a fuel system on your 310X. I'd rather have the 310X. I don't need an extra 24 inches of deck space for the back. I'm not going to hook up a cooler or a, well, I, I mean, I, I could put a cooler on there. I'll live without it. I'm okay. I don't need the multi-mount system. I don't need the back. I don't need the reverse facing facing camera. I don't need that jazz. Plus, I like the turquoise. I wish the turquoise wasn't paired with neon yellow, but eh, whatever. All right. If that if it was burnt orange, count me in. You guys know I'm a sucker for it. And I was like, I want to enjoy this ski for the way it was designed. And there are, and this is before I had my little run in with the GTX this week. You know, this is a month ago. And I was like, guys, you have a home run sitting in your hands and you're trying to convince me I need a windscreen and four speakers. I don't need that. I'd like the USB, you know, the USB port. And that's just an addition that any dealer can put on or I could put on in my garage. Put the USB port in there just so that my phone's not running dead. I don't need all the other crap in the dashboard. Let me just enjoy the damn ski for what it is. Count me in. And they're like, oh. Okay. Well, you're a racer. So I'm like, dude, I'm 44 years old. I got gray in my beard. I got three kids. I'm not a racer anymore. All right. I'm 30 pounds over my race weight. I'm like, I'm just a dude who wants to ride the ski because I love, I love this hull and I love a lot of attributes with the ultra. And it's funny because I, I took that conversation and I pulled it out and I put it in my, on my desk for preparation for this week. And I go, that was probably the most cogent thing I could have possibly said was I'm like, oh, okay. This, this one thing changes my whole decision-making paradigm when it comes to how do I, how do I buy a ski or what ski do I look for? What do I look? Let me try this again. It changes my decision-making paradigm for what I look for in a watercraft. And that is more important than anything else is how does it ride? How does it ride? And so the neat thing is, is new buyers, new buyers who anyone listening to my voice, anyone who's listening to this incredibly long podcast and me ranting about new stuff. If you think similar to me, if you and I are kind of on the same tempo and you have an opportunity to fill out one of those Yamaha questionnaires or you go to a dealership and you physically fill out one of the c questionnaires that are at dealerships. Tell them you want less garbage and more rider experience. Tell them you want it. I'll preach it. I'll, I'll preach it to anyone who'll listen. All right? I got a big bullhorn. I got the magazine. I got the podcast. I have the ear of the manufacturers. But right now, Yamaha literally told me, Yamaha's head of development looked me square in the face and he says, people want phone integration and sound systems more than they want performance. He told it to me, he told it to Jerry Gaddis, and he told it to Greg Gaddis. People want more phone integration than they want performance. I don't blame him. He's only responding to the information that has been given to him. If he told him the vast majority of people want it pink with green polka dots, he's go he's going to go, guys, we got to make pink and green polka dot skis because people are asking for it. Right now, people are asking for garbage. People are asking for 
frou-frou frills. They want sizzle and no steak. Okay? That's the problem. That's the problem. Now, the other half of that, the other half of that conversation is look at what happened. Look at what happened with the spark. Sidu asked around for five years straight. What do you want? And everyone said, bro, I want an XP. I want zero frills. I want an XP. And this is 2008, 2009, 2010. And they're like, we just came out with brakes. We just came out with suspension. And they go, screw all that noise. I want a 1996 XP. And people go, kind of like, well, that doesn't make any sense. It makes perfect sense. Because I'll tell you what, right now, 2013, it was a 2014 model, the Spark comes out. And all the advertisements are all these mustachioed, scarf-wearing freaking hipsters. Drinking IPAs and driving Toyota Priuses or Pri or whatever the hell you call them. And they're all sitting there and they're just like wearing tight jeans and capri pants and going, oh, we're all driving our little Toyota Yaris to the launch ramp with our new pink spark. And that's all the advertisements where all these young goofballs, all these hipsters going out riding sparks. Here's the catch. Who bought the Spark? Who That first year of the Spark, who bought it? It was guys my age who were trying to rewind the clock and buy a new XP. Because they wanted the ski that they rode when they were 20. And so they went out and they bought a Spark. Because the Spark was basically an XP. It was lightweight. The first two YouTube videos. The first two YouTube videos on YouTube, the first two videos were both guys in their 40s. One guy was jumping it, all right, at, off of freaking St. Pete, all right. It was uh, Joe Zamatoro because he got one of the first ones. Joe Zamatoro, I think that's his last name. I'm sorry, Joe, if I'm mispronouncing your name and you and you hear it, you're like, dude, Kevin, I've known you for years. You can't pronounce my last name. I apologize. I'm a jerk. Um, and Tim McCurcher. Tim McCurcher's doing his little freestyle routine, hanging over the bars, dragging his leg, going around doing figure eights and all that kind of crap. And Joe Zamatoro putting air underneath it. All right. Wasn't freaking hipsters buying this damn thing. All right. It was it took a year or two before those new people to be like, oh, okay, maybe I should buy a CD Spark. It was middle-aged guys going out there going, oh, sweet. It's a stripped-down one-seater. That's what the Spark was. And that's who the first audience was for the Spark. And guess what happened when they start jumping the Spark? All, all these overweight 45-year-old guys start snapping the handlebars off of them. And Cedar's like, what are you doing? It's because they're jumping the shit out of it. They're having a blast. They're pretending they're 20 years old. Okay? They're having a freaking riot. They're they're laughing their heads off. They're, they're like, oh, the whole ski is plastic. Well, yeah, it's a $5,000 ski, you Mickey Mouse freaking knucklehead. Of course. Of course. It's made out of Rubbermaid trash cans. Of course. I'm not. It's not fair. I shouldn't say that. But they're goofing off on these things. And it's because the audience... And they sold every spark. It was the number one seller for five years straight. All right. They all they all jumped, jumped them and rallied them. And how many videos of guys taking the sponsons off and absolutely rail sliding these things? They're just going Rah! and just rail sliding these things 30 feet down the water. It's because it took the sponsons off. And they're like, this is great. And they're like, we don't recommend, Cedar's like, we don't recommend this. It's like, yeah, we know you don't recommend it, but what the hell? We're going to do it anyway. Okay. That's awesome. And that's a precisely what I'm talking about when it comes to manufacturers listening. All right. And the spark is never going away. It's not a 3D, it's not a failure. It's a freaking home run. They're redesigning the spark for next year with a bigger engine, with more horsepower, and it's gonna they they're probably gonna fluff the damn thing and put storage on it, and it's gonna be heavier and blah blah blah. But I'm telling you right now, 
The audience responded, the market responded to the spark, and the manufacturer in kind gave them something. And what did they do? They gave you the tricks, which what was the tricks? It had trim. But guess what? They sell the tricks outsells all sparks. Every spark there is, the tricks is the number one seller. Why? Funky colors. It's got an 01 on it, like the General Lee, and it's got trim control. Can it do wheelies? I can't believe that's a thing. I literally can't believe that's a thing. When the tricks came out, they're like, it does wheelies. I'm like, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. I now mind you, I had the flu and I had a really rotten attitude. I had a really rotten attitude. But I sat there on the beach with a hundred degree temperature, and I'm like, you made a spark that does wheelies. And they're like, yeah. I'm like, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. And they sold every one of them. I was wrong. I was 100% wrong. 100% wrong. I still think it's dumb. I still do. I'm like, okay. Whee! Did a wheelie. Can I try it? Sure. Here's how you do a wheelie. Whee! Okay. I still think it's goofy. But guess what? Still sell them. You guys do not have to listen to me. That's fine. What do I matter? But I'll tell you what. Yeah. And the tricks is the reason why the EXR is now the Wave Blaster. Because dealerships are like, bro, you need a Trix. And they're like, oh, we don't want to do one. We have a race one. And they're like, people don't want to race. People want to do wheelies and do goofy things. And they go, okay, fine. So they put foot wedges on the freaking EXR. <laughs> and static handlebars. Great. Jet blaster, not wave blaster. Yeah, ooh, ooh, watch your mouth. You're going to get in trouble. Just like me. So, again, again. We can course correct this. We really can. People want sound systems. Fine. Fine. People want GPS navigation. I'm fine with that. I'm good with that. Syncing it with your phone, pain in the butt. But I'm afraid that it's only going to get worse. The muting, the insulating of the rider making the skis easier to ride. And that sounds that sounds kind of harsh, but making the skis easier to ride and easier to operate creates inferior riders. Just say it. Okay. Um it's interesting. I brought up I I I brought up the new stand-ups. I was talking with a friend of mine about it. And I'm like, I really like the new Super Jet. And he goes, why do you like the new Super Jet? He goes, I think it's ugly. I'm like, ah, I'm not really worried about how it looks. I kind of like the way it looks, but whatever. I'm not really bothered by it. He says, why do you like the new Super Jet? And I said, well, I had an SXR 160. They call it a 160 now. It's not a 1500. They call it a 160. Um, so I'm going to retroactively call it a 160. <clears throat> Excuse me. I said I had an SXR 160 for a summer. And I hated it. I hated it. I didn't enjoy riding it. I thought it was too fast. I thought it was way too heavy. I thought it was un ungangly. I thought it was bit too big and long. And all the proportions were off. And I just, I just had problems with it. I just, I'm like, man, I, nothing about this feels natural. Now I had an SXR 800 for two years and I loved the SXR 800. I didn't ride it nearly as much as I wish I did today. I wish I rode it every day. I, I love the SX, SXR 800. Proportionally, the, proportionally, the SXR 800 is toit. It's perfect. It's perfect. It's a perfect ski. It's two-stroke, but it's a perfect ski. Balance, power-to-weight ratio, everything about it. Everything about the SXR, out of the box, 800 was perfect. 1500 was... Blech. It just... Blech. You know, toit like a tiger. Yeah, toit. Um... I'm telling you, yeah, I absolutely love the 800. I wish I, I wish I had one. Um, but no, 
Because your dollar sucks. They're not going to lower the prices at all. Your dollar buys you less, Ray. Your dollar's worth less. Will Coca-Cola lower the price of Coke? No. Your dollar buys you less. Look at a vending machine. How much is a can, how much is a can of Coke compared to five years ago? It's gone up a quarter, if not more. It's a very easy scale to watch. Let's print more money. Woohoo! That'll lower the price. <laughs> Put the cocaine back in Coca-Cola. <laughs> oh, they'll sell a lot of it now. Um, but and talking about the stand-ups, I was like, you know, I really like, I really like the the new super jet. And he, and he was kind of feeling me out. He was kind of like, well, you know, I want to know why why you like it, because I'm a, I I consider myself a very mediocre stand up writer. I do. I I'm not a good stand up writer. And I said, well, you know, I liked this, I liked that. Reboarding kind of sucks, and I wish they had you know rubber. I wish they had pads on top of the railing and a few other little things. I said, but I like the adjustable handlebars. I could get a, the height was good. I like the balance of it. But then here was the kicker. I said, I like learning mode. I said, I like the learning mode. I think the learning mode is great. That's more of my that's more of my speed. He goes, there's the answer. I was like, what? He goes, right there. Learning mode. And he goes, why do you like learning, learning mode? I said, well, it's not so brappy. You know, the... You know, the acceleration curve is a little bit more mellow. You know, it's it's just, you know, it carries you through a little bit better through the turn. I like the learning mode. And he said, and you tried it on the other one. I said, oh, yeah, I spent hours with the regular mode and then put it on learning mode. And I went back and forth. I really enjoyed learning mode. And he said, what if there was no learning mode? Would you like the ski as much? And I said, you know, probably not. And he says, all right, well, do you think learning mode would help sell more skis? I said, yes. And he goes, do you think having more people on stand-ups is a good thing? And I said, yes. And he goes, all right, so you got, you got a little bit of a problem. I go, well, what do you mean? And he says, you want more stand-up writers. You're trying to tell people we want less bells and whistles, but you're literally advocating the ski because of one of these bells and whistles. I go, I'm a hypocrite. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I'm a hypocrite. Because I believe one of the best attributes of the new super jet is learning mode. And we just talked about how these things make lesser riders because if it didn't have learning mode and this is kind of what I want to get to was if the super jet didn't have learning mode I would have to I would have to acclimate myself in order to ride the super jet effectively and that would teach me a skill set that would it's not it's not I'm not going to break the ski, like breaking in a horse and suddenly the ski is going to act in learning mode, I'm going to have to raise my riding ability to make, meet the super jet. And he goes, precisely. And he goes, and look how long it took for the racers to acclimate to the 1500 cc, or it's a 1493 or 1496, uh, to the 1.5 liter SXR. They all hated the SXR when it came out. They all hated it. Every stand-up racer hated it until the aftermarket was able to massage it and get it to behave correctly. And suddenly racers swear by it. I go, okay. And he says, so where do you stand on it? Where do you stand on modern conveniences on new watercraft? And I said, well, if it helps encourage new enthusiasts, I'm all for it. If it results in more distracted riders, I'm really against it. And he says, yeah, that's going to probably be the ground you need to stand on. 
is distracted, you know, distracted riders, um, in, unattentive or distracted riders versus uh, learning a skill set and graduating and building up. So that's kind of where I ended up on this whole on this whole topic. You know, I think the hardcore racer still needs to go out and pursue a GP 1800R SVHO or a stripped down RXPX or a 310X, the performance guy. I think the biggest mistake Kawasaki has made is not offer the naturally aspirated ultra with all the bells and whistles of the LX. Because the naturally aspirated crowd, they're not in high speed situations where they're going to be terribly distracted, hopefully in a in a in a situation where it's high stakes. And they're sitting there messing with their dash when they're in some high speed serpentine or something like that. Um, I think there is always a room for the Wave Blaster XP, the one seater, small, lightweight sit down. I believe that a stand up, um, no, <laughs> that's funny. Um, I believe stand ups are the single best. I don't care what stand up it is. Now, if you learn on a 550, then you're a freaking champion. Well, I mean, I learned to ride on a 550. I'm not very good, but a 550 will make you a man. <laughs> um, but I believe cutting your teeth on a stand up will make you the single best watercraft rider, regardless of what watercraft you're on. Being a proficient stand-up rider will make you a phenomenal watercraft rider. Why do I say that? I say that because I believe lifelong motorcycle riders are some of the best car drivers. Because motorcycle riders could die at any minute on our freeways. Especially today with people on phones and people with full freaking digital screens taking up the whole center console. All right. Motorcycle riders have my, have the utmost respect for me. Uh, absolutely. So motorcycle riders, in my opinion, are almost always the best car drivers because they have the most or the most, the sharpest situational, situational awareness. Bar none. Bar none. And that's why, I transfer that over to stand-up riders. Stand-up riders can read the water better. Stand-up riders are always on a swivel. Stand-up riders are the most cognizant riders on the water. They are. All right. They're they're simply the most aware riders on the water. So you put them on a sit-down, they're still thinking like a stand-up. Usually. Usually. I know that's a blanket statement, but um, that's typically how I feel. So that's really kind of the takeaway from it. Now, I made jokes about people being like, well, how stable is it? And is it a wet ride? And, um, you know, all that all that kind of stuff about like, oh, people come up to me going, Kevin, how wet of a ride is it? I'm like, are you wearing denim overalls? What? Do you, why do you care? It's a jet ski. You're going to get wet. Well, well, I don't want to be sopping wet. Okay. Well, you know, it's like, it's like being in line at Splash Mountain at Disneyland. All the signs say, caution, you may get wet. It's a log ride. Anyway. Um, but yeah, you know, I mean, it's, it's difficult because I'm not trying to come down on anyone. I'm not trying to trash on people who are lured in by the bells and whistles and the comfort and all the neat stuff. But the problem is that if they are unawares otherwise of everything that goes into a personal watercraft purchase and 
what goes into riding different sea states and, and different conditions. <sighs> We're in a, a totally different conversation. Because the guy goes, oh, man, the seat's so comfortable, and I love the center storage, and, oh, the dashboard, X, Y, Z. I'm like, well, where are you going to go ride it? Oh, I'm up in Oregon. I'm like, oh, <laughs> you're going to ride the Pacific Ocean in that thing? Well, yeah. Oh, oh my gosh. You're going to pull. You're going to want to pull the train plugs. I'm like, you're going to hate this thing. Oh, really? Yeah, really. So it's... It's kind of incumbent upon us who have a little bit of a clue to help educate these guys. It's a little bit of the guy going, "Hey, can you can you help me launch my ski? I'll help you launch it, but I'm not doing it for you. I'll back you in. I'll I'll do all the hand signals and I'll make sure you can see me in your mirrors and I'll make sure you're straight, but I'm not backing your car in for you. You're a grown man. You know what to do." So, but yeah, that's, I mean, that's kind of my take on this whole thing. I know it wasn't such a fire brand. I wasn't like throwing bombs at people going like, God, oh, you suck and you don't know how to ride. Rah! I'm really posing the dangers of this kind of stuff because I believe that, you know, it might seem like a little thing right now. Well, who cares if it's got cruise control? Oh, who cares if it's got steering assist? Oh, it's convenient. It's nice. It's got this little thingy. That makes stuff easy for you. Well, what happens 10 years down the line? You got people who have no idea how to operate a jet ski. Or you have no pe- you have people who don't know how to back up a trailer because everyone's got backup cameras and backing, backing assist. So no one knows how to back up anything. And suddenly, they're SOL. All right? It's the same thing with public education. It's the same thing with... Well, we're, we're singularly the most informed. We are the most informed, but stupidest generation of people. We are absolutely, absolutely the antithesis of self-reliant. We are. Power goes out, half of you are dead. Where's my food coming from? Where's my water coming from? What do I do? No idea. All right. So uh, that's it for today. Uh, I'm already in an hour and 40. So (laughs) we're going to, yeah, driving a manual stick shift. Oh, boy. I I didn't even go into stick shifts. That's a whole different creature. Um. Again, red jerseys appear on the store, watercraftjournal.com, this Friday. You'll see pictures and uh, prices will be there. So watercraftjournal.com backslash shop. It'll be at the store there. Um, I don't think we're going to have any new videos this week. I mean, besides obviously the, the quick topic, quick topics that I do every day. Um, so make sure you subscribe to the newsletter so you don't miss out on the videos. Uh, but we will have the fish pro trophy review coming up soon. I'm working on all the Cowie stuff. Um, so yeah, we'll, uh, we'll get that. So jerseys, new videos. Oh, jet jam race coverage, uh, goes up Tuesday or Wednesday. I have to double check. And we will go from there. Guys, thank you again for tuning in. This was a lot of fun. I really didn't answer a lot of questions, but I just kind of wanted to stay on topic for this one. I know it was a little bit of a rant. I went over my notes as best as I could, and we'll talk soon. Guys, thanks again. Appreciate the support. Have a good night.